explain um, public talks on uh, related to IHRAP. Today we have our um, uh, own Anish. I, I think we could pronounce your last name, Subramanian, right? That's good. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, he's a, a, a co PI for the IHRAP and also a, a assistant professor at the University of Colorado. Um, he works on um, she, he works on um, climate science, uh, including polar area, and um, he has used uh, as a pioneer uh, used the machine learning uh, for the uh, climate and polar uh, da area data. So I think that's aligned very well with our uh, uh, focus of IHRAP. So Anish, that's all I have. Uh, so if you want to explain more about your background, uh, welcome to do so. Otherwise, you can start your presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jambu. Oh, wait, wait, wait. yeah, we are recording this uh, video, uh, this uh, this talk, just for your information. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, Jambu. And I think yeah, the first half of my talk is mostly work that I've done before iHarp, so um, that would give some background about my work. Um, Previously, and then the second half of the talk will be um, a lot of work related to IHARP methods related to what we'll use in IHARP. Um, so, yeah, I would like to acknowledge um, many collaborators, especially the IHARP team here at CU um, Zichi Yin, who's a grad student, Nidin Harilal, who's a grad student in computer science, Devan Dunmire, who's the Postdoc currently, she was a grad student at CU, and Mike McFerrin, who's a research scientist at Ceres and um, uh, at CU. Um, in addition to that, I would like to acknowledge Danny and Luke, who are a uh, couple of grad students uh, in my group who work on machine learning related uh, problems, which I'll present today. Um, my presentation today will be about exploring both physical process understanding as well as uh, machine learning methods for prediction um, and process understanding. Um, a motivation for this is uh, we would like to improve probabilistic weather and climate prediction on several different time scales. So what we would like to do is to provide accurate information at different time scales from, for example, from minutes to hours, if there's an extreme event, like a extreme snowstorm, uh, like what's predicted over a lot of US in the next couple of days, um, or a hurricane or tropical cyclone landfall. Um, we would like to predict that accurately and give uncertainty on them. And this extends to longer time scales as well. If we think so, think of days out to weeks, um, there are features like atmospheric rivers or Madden Julian oscillation, which I'll talk about briefly. Um, they they need to be predicted well to make decisions on water management, agriculture, hydropower. But along with predicting them well, we should give an accurate estimate of uncertainty associated with our prediction. And this is true all the way out to climate time scales as well. If you think of decades to centuries, think of ice sheets melting or sea ice decline in the polar regions, uh, we should be able to predict both how much they would decline, but also our uncertainty um, associated with the prediction. So that's one big motivation of um, a lot of the work we do. Um, and to improve prediction, we do need to improve our process understanding as well. Um, how does the physical climate system work? How do we model it better to help improve our prediction? So just a brief outline of the talk. I'll talk about modeling uncertainty in forecast systems, um, impact of what's known as stochastic parameterization, which is uh, one way to um, implement uncertainty modeling in our prediction systems. Um, I'll talk about this in the context of subseasonal forecasts of the Madden Julian oscillation as well as atmospheric rivers. Um, and then I'll talk about um, some, some more work I've done on machine learning for post processing atmospheric river forecasts as well as for stochastic parameterization. 
The second half of the talk, I'll be talking um, more about work that's ongoing. One of them is augmenting uh, conventional data assimilation methods with machine learning, as well as causal discovery for tropical climate variability. And then the last two uh, topics will be uh, directly relevant to IHARP, which is machine learning detection of buried lakes and other features over the ice sheet high resolution modeling over Greenland ice sheet and uh, downscaling um, over Greenland using machine learning. So just a brief introduction on prediction, uh, which is a lot of uh, work I've been doing over the last decade. Um, this is Ed Lawrence, um, who's uh, probably one of the most famous meteorologists who also um, yeah, made chaos a, a big, and popular field in mathematics and in meteorology. Um, he wrote this paper called Deterministic Non-Periodic Flow in the 1963, um, which essentially brought the problem of uh, chaotic flow in weather prediction uh, into, into the forefront. So the idea was uh, he used like a highly simplified model of um, atmospheric convection um, and this was simplified down to three uh, differential equations. So just three variables, three differential equations. But then what he discovered was small perturbations in initial condition of the integration of this model can lead to large um, differences or large error growths in the um, time integration. So I show this with an example here. Um, before I play an animation, what's plotted here in the gray dots are uh, integrated solutions of this model, um, just in the X and Z variables, so just two um, variables of the three variable model. Um, it somewhat looks like a butterfly swings. Um, it's essentially uh, the solution to those equations. And I plot them in the gray as like climatology where you run the model for a long period of time, and then you plot solutions for these long period of time. So it's showing where the solution of the model can lie um, in, in terms of a climate perspective. And I plot these three different panels um, because I initialize the model from three different regimes in this um, state. So one um, I initialize over here in the solution, um, X and Z variables. I choose 50 different initial conditions distributed um, in a Gaussian uh, uh, form around a single value. And I do the same. I um, choose 50 different initial conditions in a different location on the attractor and then uh, another location in the attractor. And I, call these predictable, semi-predictable, and unpredictable, and the reason will become obvious when I play the animation next. Um, so what you'll see here is as the model solution is integrated, I plot the 50 different values um, as the system is being forecasted forward. What you'll see in the first case, the predictable case is the ensemble stay pretty close to each other. On the bottom panel, we are looking at the anomaly just in the X variable, and the anomaly doesn't change much over time as you integrate it over 12 or 15 days. Um, the same in the middle panel, initially the uncertainty is small, but um, towards the later forecast, the uncertainty grows large. Whereas in the third case, you start seeing this large uncertainty um, um, pretty much from the beginning. So this is also seen um, in real time weather forecasts. So these are on model weather ensemble forecasts, uh, plotting probability of uh, tropical cyclones or hurricanes um, trajectory over a 15 day period. The darker blue and purple colors show high probability of where the hurricane would um, um, pass over the trajectory of the hurricane eye. Um, so here in the case of Hurricane Haiyan, you see high probability for a long period of time for a two week forecast. Whereas in the case of Hurricane Katrina, which brought a lot of destruction in the um, Gulf region, you see initially there's a high probability, but then eventually there's a large uncertainty. And this other case of Hurricane Nadine, um, which occurred in 
in the Atlantic, um, half the forecasts were predicting the uh, tropical cyclone to make landfall over Spain or go towards uh, Portugal and Spain. The other half um, predicted it going over the ocean, which would not have brought um, destruction um, to land. So th this concept about predictability and being unpredictable or predictable is true um, in weather in, in just like the simple Lorentz model. So we need to predict both our weather system, but also the uncertainty associated with our forecast to be able to use the information for decision making. Um, there are two sources of uncertainty in our weather forecast. One of them is initial condition uncertainty, which is what I talked about with the Lorenz um, example that small changes in initial condition can lead to uncertainty in our forecast. Another big source of uncertainty is model error or error in our physics parameterizations um, in our uh, Earth system models or weather prediction models. And this is a um, uh, area of research that's been developing over the last two decades, two to three decades, where there's more and more work being done on how do we represent uncertainty in our um, subgrid scale parameterization using stochastic parameterization uh, to build an uncertainty in our model uh, forecasting systems and climate models as well. Um, so the idea is that you have some initial conditions with perturbations um, that represent uncertainty in your initial conditions. These are then integrated forward with the model, but now your model is actually not one single system of equations. It's a um, set of equations with stochasticity. So you're modeling uncertainty in your forecast system as well, climate model or weather forecasting model. And this will then project forward and give you a forecast with um, uncertainty associated with it. And the goal is to get the forecast uncertainty as accurate as possible. So one common um, stochastic parameterization that's used both in the weather model that was developed in the European uh, Forecasting Center, as well as uh, it's been currently implemented and tested um, here at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in US, is called the stochastically perturbed parameterization tendencies, where you take the physics tendency at each time step of the model, and you add a multiplicative stochastic noise to this physics tendency. So it's telling you that your model solution of the um, rate of change of the winds, uh, U and V winds, or temperature or humidity, is uncertain by some amount, mu r. So you make that um, physics tendency one plus this random number perturbation times your uh, physics tendency. So that's representing uncertainty in your um, parameterization, the physics parameterization in a holistic way in your forecasting system. And there's been a lot of work um, that has looked at the impact of the stochastic parameterization on weather forecasts, um, showing that it, it does help improve reliability of our forecast better, like probabilistic reliability. Um, one of the work I did uh, previously um, before I was a faculty when I was in my postdoc was to look at the impact of uh, stochastic physics on the Madden-Julian oscillation. So the Madden-Julian oscillation is a um, large-scale convec convective system that starts in the Indian Ocean and it propagates across the maritime continent into the Pacific Ocean, and it propagates on the time scale of 30 to 90 days. And this large scale wave in the equatorial atmosphere has um, large significant um, implications, both for weather regionally over Southeast Asia and Africa, but also teleconnects to the US, to North America, as well as South American region. So this is um, a big source of predictability on uh, what's known as subseasonal time scales, like two to four week time scales. So what we looked at is uh, different forms of stochastic um, parameterization, different forms of SPPT essentially, and their impact on the prediction of the Madden-Julian oscillation 
compared to having no stochastic parameterization, which is the red line. So what's plotted here is the skill score. It's a probabilistic skill score called continuous rank probability skill score. The higher the value of the CRPSS, the better the forecast. And here we are looking at two components of the Madden-Julian oscillation. And what we see is uh, every single um, stochastically parameterized model has a better forecast of the Madden-Julian oscillation for the first three weeks or so in both the modes of the Madden-Julian oscillation compared to the red line, which is the uh, non-stochastic forecast model. Another work um, that I've done in the past is to look at a forecast of atmospheric rivers, which are um, extreme events that bring a lot of rainfall, both to the west coast of US. Um, you've probably seen uh, news about California floods in the beginning of this year, uh, which have largely been because of atmospheric rivers in the west coast. So um, what we did was to test um, a new form of stochastic perturbations in weather forecasting models where we embed a cloud resolving model within the atmospheric large scale model and we perturb this cloud resolving model. So the goal is to bring uncertainty down to scales that we don't really resolve. So here the assumption is that the cloud resolving model can resolve convection in the uh, forecast model. So we put in uncertainty in terms of um, things that uh, initiate the cloud resolving model. So uncertainty or stochastic perturbations are added um, to this cloud resolving model. And we compare this to the SPPT um, stochastic parameterization, which is the uh, most popular uh, stochastic parameterization. Um, the case we looked at was an atmospheric river event that brought um, a lot of rain to the northern uh, United Kingdom um, back in December 2015. Um, and it had record floods in the region, uh, bringing a lot of destruction and um, impacts on life and property. So we looked at um, medium range forecasts of um, these at this atmospheric river event, so six day forecast. The middle panel is showing uh, 12 hours apart the reanalysis. So this is the observed field or the true field um, with integrated vapor transport plotted in the colors here. So you see the strong um, transport of water vapor into that Northern United Kingdom, Ireland region over this 12 hour period. The left, left uh, panel is showing the forecast from the SPPT stochastic model. And the right panel is showing this uh, super parameterization, the ensemble super parameterization uh, framework that I'd mentioned with the cloud resolving model. So what we see is that the ensemble super parameterization increases the amount of um, vapor transport into the region, which is closer to what the reanalysis had for both the time steps, six days and six days plus 12 hours. So it's improving both the mean forecast. I don't show the spread here, but it improves the uncertainty on this forecast as well. Um, so then um, some work that I did after this was when I moved back to uh, Scripps, where I did my PhD, I moved back there as a scientist uh, for a year. So I worked with a graduate student there, Will Chapman, um, who's currently a postdoc at NCAR. Um, we did some work using machine learning to help improve um, forecasts of these atmospheric rivers. So the goal was to use machine learning. Uh, we used CNNs, convolutional neural networks, to train um, the forecast model to look more like reanalysis at different lead times. So the goal was, can we use these uh, CNNs that operate on image data to spatially correct the forecast field? Um, and this is a big improvement on what was previously done where um, forecasts were essentially corrected or bias corrected uh, based on station data. So they were, they were being corrected based on point-based uh, fields. 
whereas uh, something like CNN can correct the whole forecast field, bringing in spatial information in addition to temporal information. And once these uh, CNNs are trained, they are really fast and cheap to implement to post process forecast. So we implemented this um, the work is published in 2019 where um, we used the CNNs to post process the GFS, which is the US national weather forecasting model. Um, post process the atmospheric river field or the um, integrated vapor transport field over the north east Pacific region, where you do have a lot of atmospheric rivers making landfall and bringing precipitation to the Western US region or Western North American region. We show that in blue colors, um, it's the percentage improvement in these forecasts over um, two seasons. We show that in almost every region, the CNN based post processing of these forecasts help improve atmospheric river forecast. We then, um, Will Chapman led another work following uh, from this where we um, were able to generate ensemble forecasts with um, Bayesian methods or Bayesian neural networks where um, we take a single numerical model forecast and then we use a probabilistic loss function to generate ensemble solutions to these forecasts and hence the machine learning can generate uncertainty on our forecast um, more accurately. So this was, and it's much cheaper than having to run the entire numerical model uh, forward in terms of ensembles. So this is a follow on work that came out in 2021. Um, that was work on atmospheric rivers. So now I'll switch gears. I'll be switching gears a few times during this talk, um, mostly machine learning applications, but I think, this uh, would resonate with many of you in the group. Um, another work we did was to use machine learning for stochastic parameterization. And here we used a simple Lorenz 96 model, which is shown in this cartoon here. Uh, we have two sets of um, equations. X variables are in the inner circle. You can think of the X variable as the large scale atmospheric flow. And then the Y variable, um, is in the outer circle and the Y variable can be thought of as high frequency variability. So thinking about eddies um, in the atmosphere, um, those can be Y variables, and the X variables can be thought of as large scale smooth uh, flows around the atmosphere. So these Y variables can also, the Y variables force the X variables in this term. You can think of the Y variable as a subgrid scale parameter in our climate model. So it's high frequency variability that a lot of times is parameterized in our climate models. So what we want to do is to be able to parameterize or model this high frequency variability as accurately as possible and not have to integrate the Y equation, right? Which is computationally expensive. So we want to come up with some parameterization or some simplified form to model the subgrid scale forcing. So what we did was to use generative adversarial networks or GANs um, to generate the subgrid scale parameters. So the idea behind GANs is you have two different neural networks. One is the generator, which creates synthetic samples drawn from a training data set um, based on latent vectors. So it generates a synthetic sample. This is then fed to the critic network, which determines if the sample samples are real or synthetic. So the critic network would see the true sample. It gets the synthetic sample and it has to distinguish between the two, which then feeds back to the generator network. Um, and then in our example, what we want is synthetic samples that look like the subgrid scale parameterization that can generate the high frequency forcing of the large scale. Um, to do this, we did several different sensitivity uh, tests where we feed the GAN networks with just the X variable or the X variable and the previous time step subgrid scale forcing. 
we also added noise into GANs. That's one feature of GANs where you can add um, noise into the system to generate um, stochasticity. And we um, added noise in terms of white noise or red noise where we have um, correlation between the noise terms. So we did uh, tests of um, this model with the with the GAN super GAN uh, subgrid scale parameterization, we implemented that in the Lorentz ninety six model and tested it both in the weather forecasting framework where we are initializing the model and running it out to uh, two weeks. We had a fifty ensemble members, seven fifty different initial conditions, and we compute the root mean square error and compare it to the ensemble spread in the forecast. When the root mean square error and spread are close to each other, that indicates it's a reliable forecast, that the uncertainty in your forecast is given by the spread in your ensemble. And the lower the root mean square error, the better the forecast or the better the, um, uh, yeah, the model forecast. And then in the climate, framework we ran the model for um, 270 model years 20,000 model time units and then we compute the probabilistic distance from the observed uh, pdfs or the observed probability the x-axis here is showing all the different combinations of the sensitivity studies we did feeding just x or feeding x and u with large, medium, small, and tiny noise, white noise versus red noise is shown as W versus R. And the last one is a polynomial um, parameterization of the subgrid scale forcing, um, which doesn't use any machine learning. This is um, uh, just a uh, anal analytical uh, form of the subgrid scale forcing. So what we see here is that the X um, X and X U small white noise terms, the ones here, are, have a more reliable forecast, which is um, the spread and the RMS error are close and they are both low. And also in the climate framework, their probabilistic distance from the true PDFs are also small. So that um, shows that these two configurations do well both in the weather forecast and in the climate long integrations. And they do better than the polynomial fit um, for the parameterizations. So that's the summary of the first part. Um, most of the work done uh, before I moved to CU Boulder as a faculty. Um, just to quickly summarize, um, I showed that the MJO forecast skill was improved in the first two weeks with SPPT. MGO coherence and strength is better represented in stochastic climate models. I did not show this, but um, uh, it's there in the, yeah, I have extra slides to show that. Also extreme weather events such as atmospheric rivers, tropical cyclones are better uh, forecast and better represented um, using these uh, stochastic um, uh, forecast models. And I showed some results where we used machine learning approaches to improve both weather and climate forecasts and uncertainty in these forecasts. So now I'll come to the second half of my talk, which is mostly work that is ongoing currently in the group. The first two studies are not directly relevant to IHARP, but still of interest, I think. Um, so uh, Luke Howard, who's a grad student, is currently looking at augmenting um, conventional data assimilation methods with um, CNNs, with machine learning approach. So combining ensemble uh, Kalman filter with CNNs to help improve data assimilation. So just a quick uh, tutorial on data assimilation. Um, we have a true field, a true state, which is the green. You can think of this as the true um, state of the atmosphere or the um, ocean or ice uh, states. Then you have a model forecast, which is um, most definitely likely to be wrong. Um, it forecasts uh, something different from the true state. And then you, you have observations which are in the red. So your data assimilation methods are trying to move your model closer to the truth closer to the observa observ observations, which is also closer to the truth. 
the observation here doesn't lie on the truth because any observations we take of the real world has our errors associated with them, instrument errors, uh, representational errors, and other errors. So your data assimilation methods are these steps where you're trying to push your model closer to the observations and closer to the truth. Um, that's called analysis in the data assimilation literature. Um, traditional data assimilation methods are quite computationally expensive. They require both an ensemble integration. So you, you, you have to integrate your weather or climate model multiple times um, for a given time period. And you also have to invert large uh, matrices to get this optimal solution between the observation and the model forecast. In particular, um, current day satellites generate um, huge amounts of data, high resolution data, but because of the expense of these data assimilation methods, um, only a small fraction of the satellite data is assimilated into our um, forecast models, weather forecast models mainly. So our goal was to use machine learning methods, which are fast once they are trained, to help augment and help use more observations in data assimilation. So we again use the Lorentz 96 model to test this. Um, I'll not go through the details of the model again, but we use the model for one integration. We call that the truth. Then we can sample this model, um, generate observations from the model, and then we can assimilate those observations back into another integration of the model where there is error in the model forecast. So the experimental setup that Luke did was um, one case where you assimilate all the observations using the ensemble Kalman filter. Um, you assimilate high resolution observations. You're observing the full state of the system and you assimilate all of that with the ensemble Kalman filter. This is a, a quite an expensive uh, task if you do this for the real atmosphere. For the Lorentz 96 model, it's not as expensive. It's still more expensive than the second experiment where we assimilate sparse observations. We take every fourth variable in the Lorentz model and we assimilate that every uh, four time steps. And then an augmented method uh, which Luke tested was to use this conventional uh, ensemble Kalman filter with low resolution observations. And then in the intermediate uh, steps, you do a high resolution data assimilation using um, CNN, using machine learning to get the model closer to observations. So just one quick result on this. Um, yeah, Luke has a manuscript on this that's um, about ready to submit for peer review. So we train the model um, to make the CNN reproduce analysis closer to what analysis you have when you have the full ensemble Kalman filter data assimilation. And then you test it um, in, a, in a second phase where you, you have not seen any of the analysis. The blue is the augmented state, the error in the augmented data assimilation uh, system. And the red is the sparse observation data assimilation where you don't assimilate all the observations. And um, one thing you see is the augmented data assimilation does worse than assimilating everything with ensemble Kalman filter, but it's computationally cheaper. And it does better than the ensemble Kalman filter when you have sparse observations, when you assimilate only few observations. This is again shown on the right plot also, the RMS error versus the spread um, in, um, as a function of the forecast lead time. So here um, he's able to show that using machine learning to augment conventional data assimilation can help improve weather forecasts also in addition to the data assimilation. Um, another thing he tried was to use this explainable AI method called SHAP. Um, and using the SHAP values, you can approximately um, understand the contribution of the input variables for your output analysis field that he had. So it's peering into the black box of the machine learning model. 
Um, and again, a quick result on this, the SHAP values of the CNNs that were used to augment the data assimilation uh, gave us results that are consistent with expectations. So one of the results was that it, it picked up the correlation of your state variable with a variable um, two spatial points away from you. And that's based on the equations of the model. The CNN was able to learn this correlation, higher correlation with X J minus two. Um, and we were able to discover this through using the SHAP values. So in conclusion, um, yeah, I'll skip over this. The augmented data assimilation method was able to improve uh, upon the conventional data assimilation where you assimilate uh, sparse observations. And another work um, that's being done in the group by a grad student, Danny Du, is to use causal discovery methods for tropical climate variability. Uh, Sahara, who's a grad student in IHART with Jian Wu, is also looking at this in the polar regions. Here we are looking at the tropical regions. The method um, we use is the PCMCI method. Uh, we use the library developed by Jacob Runge in Germany. Um, so the PCMCI method uh, is able to discover lagged relationships, lag one, lag two causal link maps between different time series that you feed it. A more recent development in the PCMCI is called the PCMCI plus, which can discover contemporaneous links as well. So lag zero causal links can also be discovered with this new PCMCI plus uh, algorithm. So Danny used this to link monsoon prediction over the northern Indian Ocean region to variability in the Indian and Pacific um, Ocean region. So she uses the monsoon interest monsoon index, the um, Indian summer monsoon index, which is the difference between um, the zonal winds, U850 winds in this box compared to uh, another box in the Northern Indian Ocean. So that gives the strength of the Indian monsoon, this index, the difference between these two zonal wind components. And she, she then tried to find causal links between that monsoon strength or the monsoon index to atmospheric states um, in the tropical um, atmosphere. So she used the geopotential height over the tropical regions, 30 south to 30 north. Um, we select EOFs to reduce the dimension instead of using every grid point. She used uh, rotated EOFs to isolate um, the higher um, variable uh, EOFs. And then you do a causal discovery map between um, these EOFs and the uh, Indian summer monsoon index. And one thing that came out of this PCMCI plus result was it showed a low pressure anomaly over the West Pacific can strengthen the Indian summer monsoon at a one week lead time. And this was um, at least from all the literature we have seen not being discovered before. And um, we then thought about what is the physical mechanism behind this causal relationship so you can do some composite analysis um, based on this um, EOF analysis to discover what are the physical fields that map onto this linkage between the Western Pacific anomaly and the monsoon. And what we see is that there is this propagating mode, which is um, through atmospheric Rossby waves. This pressure anomalies can propagate into the Indian summer monsoon region and uh, cause variability in the Indian summer monsoon region. Um, and that was something we discovered using this methodology. So um, now I'll shift gears into um, ice sheets and polar applications, work being done directly by the IHARP group here. Um, this is a video of a buried lake um, and uh, shared by Devon who's a postdoc here. Um, I think more, many of you, or most of you have met her at the IHARP All Hands meeting as well. Um, yeah, it's a very cool <laughs> video of underground, under the ice sheet, um, liquid water and a lake below there. 
So she has been um, building a convolutional neural network to automatically detect these buried lakes across the entire Greenland ice sheet using satellite imagery. imagery. So the way she does this is <clears throat> using microwave satellite imagery. Um, so you have the Sentinel-2, which is an optical satellite, which you don't really see buried lakes as well, whereas um, ice and snow is transparent to microwave, whereas liquid water absorbs the microwave. So using the Sentinel-1 microwave imagery, you can actually detect these buried lakes below the surface. Um, so you can use this data set to then um, identify these buried lakes across the Greenland ice sheet. And then the goal is to understand the spatio-temporal distribution of these buried lakes and how do they interact with the entire ice sheet system. So she's been generating <clears throat> CNN classes using both these optical and microwave images um, of these um, different features, smooth ice, textured ice, buried lakes, um, mountains, nunataks. So all these different features, which then you can train a network to detect all the buried lakes and then um, be able to study them um, compared to ever before, because you have a new data set of these buried lakes. Um, so one thing that she's uh, seen is that there was a large increase in buried lakes in 2019. Um, there's a <clears throat> image on the left is a 2018 uh, number of buried lakes compared to 2019. Um, there's a large increase in the number of buried lakes and um, one of the main reasons uh, Devon has hypothesized is that this is due to a warmer fall in 2019 where many lakes did not freeze all the way through to the bottom. So they froze on the top, but then you have this buried liquid water below the surface. <clears throat> and this is just one um, lake in the Northwest Greenland that she looked at. Um, this is a time series of, and <clears throat> also showing liquid water content. You see the um, lake formation, liquid water formation, in 2018, you see that the lake completely freezes over um, by the time you get into winter. Whereas in 2019, you have this warm uh, fall where you have a large temperature anomaly shown in the top panel. The red colors indicate warmer temperatures. So you see this lake that freezes at the surface, but below the surface, you still have liquid water, which, are, which characterizes these buried lakes. Um, so that's something that Devon is studying, detecting these um, buried lake features using machine learning and then understanding uh, physical processes related to buried lakes. <clears throat> Mike McFerrin, uh, who's a research scientist here at CU, um, he has presented about this work at the All Hands meeting as well. I'll uh, quickly recap what he presented. He's um, also working uh, with another group called Earthrise to map emerging hydrological features over the Greenland ice sheet and understand these processes better with the larger IHARP group. Um, so yeah, there's another really cool um, video that Mike shared where you can see that if you have these lakes that then drain to the bottom, this leads to lubrication of the ice sheet, which leads to larger ablation, larger uh, ice flow out into the ocean and um, um, can accelerate the ice sheet collapse. <clears throat> so Mike is working with the Earthrise Media Group, um, a number of high school teachers and students to generate these labeled data sets where uh, students can label and draw um, on these satellite images and, sh and mark where we have identified features. And these uh, data sets can then be used to train um, neural networks or machine learning algorithms to detect these features um, in an automated way in other satellite images as well. <clears throat> and then um, another project um, being undertaken by uh, and led by Zichi Yin, who's a graduate student um, here at CU, uh, is to do high resolution fully coupled simulations over the Greenland ice sheet region 
and then to um, look at these high resolution um, uh, simulations for future strong warming scenarios. <clears throat> so the motivation um, is that um, there was a paper recently looking at different model resolutions and um, their impact on the Greenland cloud and precipitation uh, led by Adam Harrington, who's a collaborator on this project, um, where he showed that having low resolution climate models, which is on the left here, F19, F09, which is one degree resolution. As we go to higher and higher resolution, we see um, many more spatially distributed features in terms of uh, clouds and precipitation variability. This is also true about how they impact the ice sheet below um, where the ice sheet is being resolved at four kilometer resolution. So uh, Zichi's uh, effort is to use um, a variable resolution climate model where you have a quarter degree resolution over the entire Arctic region and then a one degree resolution in the rest of the globe and look at this higher resolution um, model and how it impacts the ice sheet processes in the future, um, four times CO2 runs. Um, Zichi again had presented at the all hands meeting, so this is mainly a, a recap of his work. <clears throat> so he has um, done more work following the all hands meeting where now we have completed the simulation for um, the 150 years of the future simulation. So what we, um, what he is uh, 350 years, sorry, not 150 years. So 350 years out into the future, comparing it to the pre-industrial uh, simulation, we see um, much larger regions of reduced ice thickness here, as well as increased um, ice flow or increased ice velocity, um, both in the interior of the ice sheet or going um, all the way to the coast. Um, and this increased ice flow from the interior towards the margin um, is likely due to the steeper slopes as the ice sheet ablation continues. The ice sheet shrinks and you can get steeper slopes that um, lead to increased velocity. And, and finally, um, I'll talk about uh, some work that we have just um, started discussing. This is led by Nidin Harilal, who's a computer science graduate student at CU. Uh, Nidin has worked, um, is um, Nidin's advisor, Claire Montiglioni, uh, myself and Nidin, we have, and another collaborator, Bry um, Matthias Hodge, we have worked on downscaling climate model projections um, over the continental US for energy applications, for solar energy and wind energy applications over the past uh, year and a half. Um, Nidin developed this enhanced statistical downscaling algorithm um, where uh, you can use this machine learning method to downscale climate model simulations to higher resolution uh, features uh, via image super resolution. So we currently are um, exploring options to use this algorithm and also develop other algorithms to downscale reanalysis data over the Greenland region. So current atmospheric reanalysis data, ERA-5, um, has a resolution of about 32 kilometers or so. We want to go down to uh, four kilometers or two kilometers. There is a high resolution uh, reanalysis data for like 25 years, so 30 years period over the Greenland called CARA. It was recently developed, I think released a couple of years or a year ago, uh, CARA West over Greenland. So we would use this as a training data set to extend it um, um, to way back in, in the past uh, using the coarser resolution reanalysis. Um, Nidin has worked on, um, like I mentioned, downscaling solar um, energy. Um, we used a one, a degree or a 100 kilometer climate model projection, ran it through the enhanced SD um, algorithm to downscale uh, down to a quarter degree uh, resolution, a fine resolution um, solar energy map, which, which can then help inform decision-making about solar energy production at a higher uh, spatial scale. Um, 
And then, yeah, so now we are exploring options of using CARA, which is a 2.5 kilometer resolution um, data set over uh, two regions in the Arctic, the Greenland region, which is called CARA West, and then there's a CARA East grid as well. This is just a map showing ERA-5, the um, ECMWF reanalysis at 32 kilometers compared to CARA reanalysis. So the large scale features look similar, but um, if you look closely, the fine scale features, there is a lot of difference in the spatial variability in this high resolution data set. So we can use this to train downscaling algorithms and uh, generate higher resolution surface atmospheric fields, which can then be used uh, to run ice sheet fern models or other uh, models relevant to the Greenland ice sheet. So I'll summarize with that. Um, the second half of the talk, I showed that uh, machine learning can be used to augment conventional assimilation methods to improve data assimilation and state estimation. Uh, I also showed an example of causal discovery methods that can help discover uh, previously unknown physical links in our climate system. Um, I also showed machine learning can be used for detecting features over the ice sheet that are critical to the hydrological cycle over the ice sheets. They help understand uh, variability in these features like the buried lakes, um, and then also interactions between these features and the larger ice sheet. Um, and then um, Zichi Yin is leading effort on high resolution modeling over the Greenland ice sheet, which can help improve process understanding over the region, mass balance over the ice sheet. Um, and then finally, machine learning based downscaling over the region can help improve um, both process understanding for atmospheric phenomena, as well as produce data sets that can force high resolution firm models, uh, which is one of the motivations we have for that project. With that, I'll end. Uh, thank you, and yeah, I'll take questions. Thank you. That's a very comprehensive uh, review of your research. Uh, and then I saw yeah, you joined a few minutes and after this um, meeting uh, starts. You want to moderate or you want me to moderate? Uh, no, please, please do moderate. Uh, Anisha, I'm sorry I was a bit delayed, So, uh, but no this problem. is an exciting talk, so I'm, I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Uh, Jianwu, you can go ahead and moderate. Thank you. Okay, sure. Uh, I think uh, Baru has a question on, on the chat. Uh, Baru, maybe you can talk uh, directly. Instead of uh, I read your question, maybe you can uh, and talk to explain your question, Baru. Yeah, thank you, Jianwu. Uh, so I don't remember if it's really <laughs> which slides I'm asking about because I think if I remember right before the conclusion of section one, it's about the uh, generative adversarial network. So you did also ensemble model for different. This one, with different parameters, parameterizations, right? Yeah. I think that I remember one? correctly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I my question is uh, what are the ensemble members here? Is, is it oh, are they uh -huh. GN model with different parameterizations? Yeah, so the ensemble members would be similar to what I showed like in my um, example here where we would choose a certain initial condition and we would perturb, um, add a small perturbation around that initial condition to add initial condition uncertainty. And then in addition to that, like I mentioned, in using GANs, um, we can add noise within GANs, right? So that can generate um, uncertainty every time step that the GAN uh, parameterization is generated. So you're adding uh, stochastic noise to this system. Um, so the GAN parameterization will replace this term in the model equation. Um, so you add um, random noise um, or the random perturbations within the GAN. So it would generate a slightly different subgrid scale tendency for each ensemble member that you're integrating. Mm. Does that Okay. Yeah. Okay. And also, how to concatenate the prediction model for different members? Yeah. So, um, in terms of concatenation, one we look at the ensemble mean, right? So, if we have fifty um, 
so we have 50 ensemble members for the forecast. So you have 50 different solutions for every single time that you're mm -hmm. forecasting. You can average those 50 members. So that would be the ensemble mean solution. Or you take simply the average. average of yeah, the average, right. So that, then okay. you can compute the root mean square error of this average. And then the ensemble spread is the standard deviation of those 50 members. So that would give the uncertainty around this mean value, right? Okay. So the okay. Ensemble spread. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, um, Sahara had a similar question. Maybe Sahara can ask, then we go to the Sudeep. Go ahead, Sahara. My question was about um, part one as well. It was about the uncertainty. So I remember Dr. Subramaniam was mentioning two kinds of uncertainties, and one of them he said was the initial condition uncertainty. So I wanted to know if it is same as what we perceive as data uncertainty, um, and by data uncertainty, I mean by the uncertainty that goes in, inside um, through the data sources or the sources from where we acquire data. Or if it is not the same, then how are both of them different? Yeah, um, so this is somewhat related to the data assimilation uh, plot that I showed. So the initial condition uncertainty is um, uncertainty in the model initial condition, right? So if you are using a model and you're integrating the model forward, for instance, if you take this simple Lorentz model to integrate these equations forward in time, you need some value of X, Y, and Z. Um, and that is true even about our um, Earth system. Like when, if you're integrating the ocean, atmosphere, ice sheet, land forward, you need some value for the variables that you're initializing. So that is different from the observation uncertainty, but it's related to observation uncertainty. And the reason it's related to observation uncertainty is the um, data assimilation that I talked about. So what we are doing when we initialize our model is we take some solution and we run the model forward from this solution. The initial condition for weather forecasts come from uh, data assimilation where we have a model solution we have observations with uncertainty around these observations, like what you mentioned, Sahara. So these each observation of our real world, there is uncertainty associated with the observation. So then the data assimilation method or the optimization method tries to find the best solution between this uncertain observation and your model, because the model is following the physics of the system, right? So you want to constrain the physics but you also want to get the solution closer to observation. So your data assimilation generates what's known as the analysis correction or the analysis step. And that is what is used to initialize the model the next time. So this analysis step will have uncertainty. That's where the initial condition uncertainty comes from. So it's related to the observation uncertainty, but also uh, the model solution. Does that help? Yes, yes, it was something new for me to learn today, but yeah, now I have a bit more clarity about it. Thank you so much. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, let's move to Sudeep. I hope we can stay a little bit, a few more minutes since uh, we, we, if we didn't, uh, didn't have too much time to ask questions, so we can stay. Uh, if you have time, stay a few more minutes. Go ahead, uh, Sudeep. Oh, hi, Anis. Nice talk. Um, I have a question for you, like uh, for atmospheric rivers like did you ever work on like predicting the ivt values especially like a few uh, months of lead time like say for california uh, yeah. uh -huh. right so few months have um, mainly collaborated with a group at scripps in san diego where we look at seasonal prediction of atmospheric rivers um, but a few weeks out to a month, there's a, a graduate student here, Tim Higgins, who's looking at two to six week uh, forecast of atmospheric rivers. Where is their skill? Because at those lead times, the skill is very little in our current generation models. Okay. Um, so we have, we have identified like a few regions where there is skill, and then we are trying to physically understand why those regions are special and 
how they are related to large scale atmospheric flow. Yeah. Oh, okay, so at this stage, it would be like a difficult to say, like if like uh, machine learning methods predicted IVT values or atmospheric rivers, do they show any relationship with the El Nino, La Nina years? You know, that reason I'm asking 2016, it was El Nino, this year was, was right. La Nina, is totally opposite physics happened. Right, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it, uh, I mean, my question is, do you think like machine learning methods can overcome this problem? Um. I mean, too early to say, I guess. Right. Yeah. It's too, yeah. I don't think anyone has tested that. Um, mm -hmm. There's some work um, done on post processing or like statistical prediction using machine learning. Peter Gibson um, has led some work. He used to be at Scripps, he's now at, in New Zealand, but he has used like um, machine learning, like CNN, to do seasonal prediction of IVT. Okay. Um, but not like actual prediction, but post-processing, you take a dynamical model, seasonal forecast, and then you correct it um, with machine learning. And he can show that like that can help improve the forecast over just the dynamical prediction. So you can add a correction using machine learning to help improve it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Uh, I do have a quick, quick question. Uh, it's uh, more high level. You uh, you have worked on both simulation climate model a lot, and recently worked on machine learning. So, so you actually know both uh, techniques well. So, I wonder your opinion on on the, like limitations, uh, advantages of e each method, and uh, what do you think of the the frontier of the uh, of the because some is, uh, uh, direct applying machine learning for. Uh, climate uh, uh, Earth uh, application has been done by uh, by most of us, and uh, for the future, it's been harder and harder. So, what do you think is the future pr uh, problems should it be working on? So yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't think the answer is quick for that. Um, and also, I'm not an expert on machine learning. I've been using machine learning methods more recently, and I'm learning a lot from like the students I work with and other experts like. <laughs> you and uh, others and I have, but um, I think the benefit of like the physical climate models is that they constrain the physics, right? Like they are solving equations of the physics that we know of the real system. Whereas when we use machine learning that can be lost, like there are groups that are trying to have physically um, constrained neural networks, um, but that physics constraint, constraint is lost. So. I think um, having a combination of both where we have this large knowledge base of the physics of the earth system that has been condensed into these equations with like 10 different variables or like a few variables, right? That keeping that knowledge um, still as part of our tool to solve and adding uh, machine learning where it's relevant, where it can help reduce the computational cost where it can help um, improve accuracy. I would see that as the path forward than using machine learning to completely replace like the physical uh, models in the physics systems. That's one answer I would have. And then in terms of the details, there are so many different problems, like the feature detection is a big problem, right? Like that machine learning is uh, super useful for that human detection is much slower. So that's one problem. Then another one is forecasting using machine learning, um, where there is um, a lot of promise in like using machine learning to improve forecasts, and you don't really need to know the accurate physics to improve forecasts. Um, but then when you think about climate time scales, you do need the physics to be constrained, like you're solving a long-term problem with physics constraints. So they're augmenting climate model solutions with machine learning, I, I think can benefit uh, the community. Well, thanks. I think uh, that's part yeah. of the, I hope we'll be studying this this uh, <laughs> section of these two technology. Uh, I don't see any new- Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, go ahead, still go ahead. have time. Um, I, I guess my question emerged from your last slide, but also this slide. Because when we do machine learning, we are looking at large amounts of data and we start making connections, which could also be random. So many, many projects, for example, in IHARP are looking at 
uh, you know, identifying non-trivial patterns. And even here, for example, when we're trying to con connect the estimate to the ground truth observations, there's mostly there's there, there is some gap, right? And you're trying to reduce that gap. Um, is there, uh, and this is a more philosophical question, like how do we assign significance to machine mm -hmm. learning findings in these situations? Because there could be random connections as well, right? And causal connections right. are particularly tricky because yeah. you're not modeling the entire world, you're modeling a very constrained problem. Right. So how do we find um, significance in those cases? Yeah, so I think one way to do that is um, working across domains, right? Like if you have a domain expert on a, certain physical process, like how does Greenland blocking link to ice sheet melt, either causal discovery or other machine learning methods can potentially identify some links or identify predictability in the system. But then going back and like talking to experts, like physics experts who have studied the system well and like know some of the links, they can use this knowledge that is discovered through machine learning to then like come up with a hypothesis of what could be a potential physical link between the system. And then you can test that either through statistical um, analysis or through physics model experiments, right? Where you can hold one uh, link fixed and then you run the rest of the system and see if the forced response is the same. So I think, I, yeah, I think that is like a critical step in my mind that you can use machine learning and other approaches to discover links, but then you need the physical knowledge to identify the physical connection between these links. Great, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay. I think we are 10 minutes uh, uh, beyond the original time. Thanks a lot, everyone. I think we are done. Thanks so much, Anish. Hey, uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. See you soon. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye.